good. All right. Oh, now we're ready. <laughs> um, again, it's a happy Sunday to everyone and uh, also to our uh, YouTube viewers. And uh, as we continue our study uh, on foundation series, we're now going to uh, another series of classes. And uh, before that, uh, we want to uh, start uh, uh, for the meantime with regards to a very important uh, doctrine. It's uh, also called this uh, covenant theology. Okay, uh, I'm sure Brother Eddie uh, gets excited here whenever he hears those uh, uh, words, uh, covenant theology. Okay, but uh, before that, uh, can we ask uh, Brother Eddie to, to uh, pray? Okay. Heavenly Father, we come before you to give all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. We thank you for this time that you've come. And just to study your word and to learn more about you and your son and, and your word, Heavenly Father. Once again, I ask now that you be with Arnold, uh, have him to lead this discussion. And just uh, give him your words and give him, uh, just uh, just watch over him, guide him, and just uh, and just give him the sermon as he leads the, the discussion, Heavenly Father. Once again, I just thank you for this time that we can study, and we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Eddie. Uh -huh. A while ago, while uh, as I was driving here, uh, going to the church, uh, uh, I uh, saw this uh, uh, the street sign again. You know, the the street before uh, uh, you arrive to this church. Uh, there's this uh, street, uh, Liberty Drive, and the Country Club. <laughs> so when I, I, I whenever I see those uh, streets, you know, it. it, it uh, always reminds me of what it is to have this liberty in Christ. You know, sometimes uh, uh, when we go to church, uh, we always think uh, of a church like a country club. But uh, um, what is important is, uh, you know, uh, we want to uh, see a church that uh, teaches the Word of God. Why? Because uh, the promises, the promises of God, the truths of God, that's what separates um, uh, a true church to other false churches. That with regard to the promises of God, we go with what the scripture is saying. And just like now, uh, we're going to talk about covenant theology. So what's the importance of this uh, great doctrine of reform, right? Um, in the past, uh, we have studied the distinction of the law and the gospel. Why law? Why we study the law? What's the importance of the law? Um, because through the law, whenever we uh, study the law or the statutes of God, the law is there. Um, it represents who God is, that God is holy and righteous. And uh, all the precepts or the law, it's a representation of his very own character. And, and that's the reason why uh, when we uh, started the series Foundation, it's also a systematic uh, theology. What we do is we pull out those uh, passages in the Bible. Uh, and, and we want to make sure what, what, what these uh, particular passages in the Bible this speaks about a certain doctrine of the Bible. So when we talk about the law, we studied about the nature of God, that he is holy, he is righteous, and he hates sin. And also when we study the law, we go through uh, classes about the nature of man and sin. We talk about the, uh, the nature of sin, the origin of sin, and the transmission of sin. Why, why we're talking about this? So we could understand the grace in the gospel because without proper understanding of uh, the holiness of God and, its, and his law and the nature of a fallen man, we will never, never understand what grace is all about or what the good news is all about. The good news. And covenant theology 
is another class that we can put right here. Because covenant theology, it's, it uh, serves as a framework of how God deals with his people, his chosen people, particularly. So, uh, and uh, I've been reading, listening, and studying this uh, great doctrine for the past few days, and I could not help it but get mesmerized by the beauty and harmony of the Word of God. The covenant, the law, and the gospel, they're all in unison, the harmony and coherence. So what? Uh, covenants of God. So uh, again, we're going to uh, be uh, uh, studying some passage in the Bible and a little bit of uh, history and the uh, we're going to mention also some uh, Westminster, Westminster Confessions. So, uh, why the New Covenant? You know, in the New Testament, particularly in the book of, uh, the book of, uh, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the superiority of Christ. That he is the New Covenant, that because of Christ, we have a better promises compared to the Old Covenant. And the book of Hebrews, if you open your Bible, in chapter 8, verse 3, 6, if you don't have your Bible, don't worry, we have it on the screen. On the screen. And let me read to you uh, this uh, passage. For every high priest is appointed to offer both, both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there, there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. So uh, we're going to divide it into different sections. So the concept of covenant. So when we say covenant, it's just uh, not a word for uh, agreement. The covenant that God made to men. And uh, throughout the Bible, uh, this covenant uh, it comes in many ways. So we have this uh, Adamic covenant we can see in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. There's the blessing and the curse. And then Wahi covenant. So what is this uh, in Genesis chapter 2? When God told Adam that... Uh, he put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God made and commanded the man, saying, Of every tree the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For the day you eat, you will die. So, you see, that's the covenant that God made to Adam. The covenant of work. Um, you obey, you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be blessed. You'll, have, uh, you'll attain life. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. And there's also, uh, out of that uh, covenant, covenant of works also, there came the, the proto evangel, the first mention of the gospel. In Genesis chapter 3, and I will put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and you shall bruise his heel. And later on, it was fulfilled on the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. What about the Noahic covenant or God's covenant to Noah? So it was attested by the rainbow um, that after uh, the earth was flooded, 
So God promised uh, Noah, never again he will he destroy the earth through the flood, okay? And we have the rainbow, the promise. And also, uh, uh, as we go through the Bible, uh, we can see this promise, the covenant, was extended to Abraham or the Abrahamic covenant. Where in the, uh, God chose Abraham and said, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And you will be a blessing. So that's a promise to Abraham. And then there's a Mosaic covenant that was uh, ratified in Mount Sinai. And that's why some uh, theologians call it the Sinaitic covenant, wherein God promised uh, Moses. Uh, and also there, also, the, the laws were given. And uh, best exemplified by uh, the stone tablet or the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 24. And later on, as we study the passages in the Bible in the book of uh, Chronicles and Kings, we see the promise, the Vedic promise, that out of the line of David, there, there will come a king, a promised king, wherein he will rule from everlasting to everlasting. And that promise also was again mentioned during the time of prophet Jeremiah, where in the days come, says Yahweh, that I will perform the good works which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a branch of righteousness to grow up to David, and he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. That's a promise. So, you talked about the elements. It looked like you missed number four. No, I saw one, two, three, and then five and six. Is it only oh. five or? Ah, just, just a typo error. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, because uh, 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 among the covenants, of course, uh, if you study covenant theology, they are, they are uh, subdivisions. Uh, like uh, you study Adamic. There's the creation covenant and the post-creation. And uh, so uh, there's some terminology. So what, happens in, what happened is I deleted some of them just to make it short and simple. So uh, let's continue. It's not that uh, we're missing a particular covenant <laughs> or else uh, we'll get lost. <laughs> okay, so covenant. So when we say covenant, what particularly comes to your mind? I know uh, probably Pastor Don already thought about this, and some of you, this might just be a, a review, okay? Wow. So when we talk about covenant, what comes into our mind when we uh, hear the word covenant? Agreement. Agreement. That's right. Short and sweet. That is what you call agreement. And when we say agreement, actually there's a historical narrative. You know, uh, we all know that the Old Testament, uh, they were written in Hebrews. But during the time of exile, during the time of uh, Alexander the Great, now everybody needs to speak in Greek. That's why uh, we have this uh, Hellenic period, uh, 300 years before Christ. So when the Jews, uh, in trying to retain the culture, the Hebrew culture, so uh, they were uh, instructed to uh, translate the Hebrew language into Greek language, which we now call the Septuagint, right? The Septuagint. So Septuagint came from Latin word Septuaginta, or 70. Why? Because uh, that time they chose uh, 70 uh, smart people who translated the Hebrew language into Greek language. 
And there is the problem that arises. Because the Hebrew language covenant is the word berit. Berit is a Hebrew language, but when they translate it to Greek language, they started having problem. Why? Because in the Greek language, um, there is not exactly a word that will represent the word berit. Because it's true, the de by definition, testament means agreement, but berit also, that's why it's uh, oh, so important to learn this, because it's not only an agreement, there's also a plus. Plus promises. So when we say plus promise, that just, it's not just an agreement, but there's also the promises. Wherein God promises his people. Okay? While the word was used in the Greek, they only had options like dia teke. Or agreement. But, the in, but the, in the Greek mind, when we talk about agreement or testament, you know, because in testament, um, the testator, you know, sometimes they change their mind, right? And it's true. Like, uh, you know, I have uh, poor siblings, uh, uh, some, there's some, some sibling uh, situation that's happening from time to time. And because of the time difference between Philippines and United States, 12 hours, so right now it's 10 o'clock in the evening. Sometimes I will hear these uh, issues with my brothers. And just to cut the argument short, and I will tell them, let me tell you to straighten you up. Our mo mom will disinherit you. So you better straighten up. <laughs> you better fix things right away. <laughs> and that's the same goes with the, 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 the word diatike. Because the testator can change his mind easily. He can disinherit you. Right? And not only that, the testator also, the promises or the will, you know, the promises, the will, the, the the riches that you might inherit, you know, you can only have it when the testator dies. And that's the problem. That's why the atike, you know, the kind of, this doesn't exactly represent the read. Why? Because God doesn't die. <laughs> right? You can't kill God. Does it mean that you can uh, uh, build the promise of God? No, so they have a problem with this word. Now, the other word that they use is the word, in Greek word, sunteke. Sunteke, coming from the uh, prefix sin or with or together. So sunteke is an agreement, a bilateral agreement between equal party. But the Hebrew wise men, they didn't like either. Why? Because berit is not about a bilateral agreement. It is a unilateral agreement wherein God made an agreement with man. And he is the one who fulfilled the promise. There is no bilateral agreement or, or, or equal uh, laws between the two. So they removed this and ended up with the word diatike, and that's why we have the word testament. So that's the closest word that we can use. But as we study the Greek uh, uh, language, covenant theology, when we say God made a covenant to Abraham, the word there that was used covenant, of course, is berit. And the, the, the word, the word uh, God made 
also came from the Hebrew word karat, means cutting. So it's a literally, there's a cutting involved. And that's why, the, this, the, and that's the same reason the structure of covenant in the ancient Near Eastern culture, there is a, this uh, stipulations between the suzerain or the greater king and the basal or the conquered uh, king. So there's a stipulation or the law, like if you obey, you'll be blessed. There'll be, there'll be a peace in your land. There's also a curse. If you disobey, then I will punish you. So it's common. And even in our culture now, uh, marriage is based on the agreement, right? And uh, even the employee and employer relationship, there's an agreement in both. So uh, this covenant or, or relationship between a suzerain, the greater king and the lesser king, it already existed way before the biblical times. Okay? I remember in, uh, in my country, Philippines, we've been under the Spanish government for 300 years. And the Spanish con conquistadores or explorers like uh, Villalobos, when he landed the Philippines, he made a covenant with a chieftain over there. And they ratified their covenant with a cutting, the blood compact. That's how they do in the past. So, so again, when we say covenant, there's stipulations or laws in both. And the blessings and curses. So uh, the blessing and curses. Like uh, in Deuteronomy 28, you know, when God made a covenant to, to, to uh, Moses. Blessings, Deuteronomy 28. And if you faithfully obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, be careful, be careful to do all his commandments, you, you will set your high above, above all of the nations, and so on and so forth. Then, the same chapter, you can see the curses, the pronouncement of curses, the malediction. There's benediction, malediction. But if you will not obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, and, or be careful to do all these commandments, statutes, I will command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So those are very important points with regards to covenants, the blessing and the curses. And again, when a covenant is made, there's always witnesses. Like in marriage, that's why it's important. When people, they, they, they marry, they, they invite their close friends and relatives to serve as a witnesses. Because it's very important part of the covenant. What about God and man? So when God actually executes the covenant, he always used the nature. Because who else will be witnesses above God? So that's why in Deuteronomy 426, when God made a covenant, he said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. Okay, so uh, another important part of covenant is the dramatization of ceremonies. Like uh, I've said a while ago, in, in the old days, during the time of uh, 15, 1600, the Spanish uh, explorers, they have their own uh, dramatization. Cut the portion of the wrist, and then they do a blood compact. Old Testament, same thing. God requires this dramatization. So, remember uh, in Leviticus, the Day of Atonement, when the high priest needs to uh, confess his sin, right? Before he offered the uh, animal sacrifice for the people. So he confesses his sins over the bull, so, uh, and, and then he will butcher the bull and get the blood and sprinkle it to the Ark of the Covenant. So there's a uh, ceremony that is involved. And then uh, after that, then there's uh, goats. We have the scapegoat and the one that will be offered to God. So those are the 
ceremonies or dramatization. And again, Old Testament, New Testament. Why cutting of blood? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no forgiveness of sins. So now, uh, what are the three major covenants in Scripture? So, uh, we have the covenant of redemption. And what, what is covenant of redemption? When we say covenant of redemption, it is the covenant that has been made eternity past. It's a covenant made between the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wherein the Father plan the salvation and Jesus Christ the Son executes the plan of salvation and the Holy Spirit applies the work of salvation by regenerating a person. And then we have the covenant of works between God and Adam wherein God put Adam into a probationary period prior to the fall. It's symbolized by the tree of life. You know? Do that, and the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil. So, um, and then other one is the covenant of grace between God and his elect sinners. And of course, there's subcategories on this covenant you know, the Noahi Covenant, the um, Abrahamic Covenant, the Bidi Covenant, and so on and so forth. And, and that's the reason also why in Westminster Confession, in chapter 7, they specifically put this covenant doctrine into our confession. In chapter 7, section 1, See, the distance between God and creature is so great, and all the reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, that they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he had been pleased to express by way of covenant. And then in section two, the first covenant made was covenant of works, Wherein life promise was life was promised to Abraham, to I mean to Adam, and in him to his posterity upon condition condition of perfect and personal obedience. But we know what happened. Adam failed, and so he plunged hum, humanity into sin. But God did not stop there, right? Because out of that curse when Adam disobeyed God, there also came the first promise that in the seed of a woman, uh, there will come a Savior, the proto evangel in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So uh, the first promise, covenant of redemption. Again, this is an agreement between the triune God, Okay? God the Father planned the salvation. God the Son executed the salvation. And God the Holy Spirit applied the salvation. We call it regeneration. So, uh, I know, uh, what do you think is the, some questions that arise whenever we, uh, we talk about the covenant of redemption? What are some questions that arise? Uh, if you talk to your friends, yeah, a salvation, dear. Uh, it, it's been arranged from the beginning of time. So, what are the common objections that we uh, hear? Anybody? Especially uh, when we uh, read a passage like... Uh, like uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, 6, 3, 6. Blessed be the God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, 
on the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which we has blessed us in the beloved. Wow. What? On the covenant of redemption, people don't have a clue what it is. Especially the covenant theology. Mm -hmm. so, so when I try to explain it, is that God already set his plan before time. Mm -hmm. Within the Godhead. It, it's a, it, it, when I used to teach uh, uh, Sunday school, I said, that's a banana split. You know, it's got... <laughs> I like it. That's my favorite you know, ice cream. You know, it's got your nuts and your cream and the cherry on top. And God has, has, has done a plan and made a covenant with the Godhead knowing what was going to go on for the future. Mm -hmm. And it's, basically, it's a promise that, you know, that God had already thought that he's going to send his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit's going to do His work. Yes, that, that's all a good grace, all through God's sovereignty and grace. That's a good point there. So the next question is: Okay, now we understand it. So what what's in it for me? How can I apply this great truth, the covenant of redemption, in my everyday life? For example, if we're going to ask the teenagers here. This is deep stuff. No? I want something that I can apply practically in my everyday life. So how can you apply it? Let's hear it from the young people here. So how do you apply these great truths? Right? Let's ask Erin. I know, she's, she's got something in her mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll forgive you this time, Aaron, but not next week. <laughs> okay, how do you apply this? You know, in this world, changing world, we're in this so much uh, political situation that's happening here. You know, we don't know where we are heading. One day we might wake up that this is no longer the land of the free because of the so much politics that's going on. It gives us comfort. You know, that whatever, whatever life may throw in us, there'll be a political chaos, economic, you will lose your job like a lost mine. It's been a year now. But with understanding of the covenant of redemption, that God saved me before the foundation of the world, it gives me comfort and peace. That whatever happens in our lives, our salvation is secured. Our salvation is secured. So it should give us comfort and peace. But people still object, right? What are the common objections? <laughs> and that is right. That's not fair. Let me write it on the board, right? That's not fair. And we'll put a triple exclamation. That's not fair. In fact, uh, Pastor Don is going to give a sermon today <laughs> about the unconditional election. And he's going to answer this question. That's not fair, right? Where's my free will? Here we go again, going back to the free will. Now Crystal is going deeper and deeper with the issue, right? That's not fair. So how are we going to answer it? That's not fair. How are we going to answer it? You have to give an answer. This is a great doctrine, the covenant of redemption, that... He, he chose us in him before the foundation of this world that we should be holy and blameless before him 
in love, He predestined us. Then somebody asks a question. That's not fair. I don't like it. Walk away from it. So how are we going to answer it? He came. I like it. No? Short and sweet. We can. <laughs> Come on, Eddie. Just give us something. Don't leave us hanging there. <laughs> what happens is when you come to Christ, mm -hmm. you can understand now that God had a plan for you. Until your heart is regenerated, it's not fair. So the world is going to say it's not fair. That's not fair. So what you do is you share the gospel. You share because you can't throw covenant theology to the unsaved. Mm -hmm. You have to, they have to be uh, saved, regenerated to understand this. Because they, then it's not fair. Because yeah, see, uh, I'll go back with the argument of uh, uh, Spurgeon, the prince of preacher. But the problem is, we don't see the mark. If only they have a mark on their, on the back of uh, their body, that X mark, this is, <laughs> this is a saved or chosen people. Let me share the gospel to you. <laughs> but it's not like that, right? And, and I agree with that. So how are we going to argue it, right? And that's the reason uh, 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 let's, uh, let's focus on the preaching of the pastor, and uh, I'm sure he, he'll answer it. <laughs> One of the questions you need to ask these young people is, how do you feel that you know that God, that verse, God in the Bible, God had a plan before eternity to save you? Okay. You know, and what is, how does that make you think that on this covenant theology, that God had formed a, a, a covenant with the Godhead before time mm -hmm. so he can say, I wouldn't say his flesh, but to say yes. his, the, 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 uh, his people. Yes. See, you see that now the, 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 um, the pressure, right? That's a great doctrine, right? As a Christian, to, to know that we've been chosen before the foundation of this world. It gives us great comfort. But on the other side is, how are we going to communicate this truth? About how to answer this. That's not fair. But... Um, what's fair? I was going to say, if you're talking about the gospel, it's not fair. Yes, okay. That's but, not fair. But, but fairness is getting what we deserve. Yes, that's right. Getting but what we deserve. Okay. To answer your question, that's not fair. You have to share the gospel. Right? Yes, yeah. And we all agree with that. Ah, Scott, you want, you want to say something? Well, is it fair that the king is the king? And the king gets to do what the king wants to do? Yes. Yeah. Is it fair for the subjects of the king to have to put up with his decisions? Yeah. Good, good, good point. Good right? point. Because if, if God is sovereign, which he is, you can liken it to an earthly king and his serfs. Mm -hmm. And, okay, the serfs didn't put the king in place, but he's there and he has power over your life, every aspect of it. Because he's the king. Yes. So that's fair or not, he's still the king. That, that, that's a good point. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Sometimes I've approached this from the opposite perspective. If God isn't electing people and saving them from before the foundation of the world, he just allows salvation to be kind of, he tosses it up in the air and waits to see who scrabbles around to get it, then that is actually not fair because the people who would it would be the ones who think that they're the smartest or the most um, inherently spiritual. It would be, that would be unfair because the cream of the crop would rise to the top and they would hold salvation for themselves. Whereas God gives it to um, poor, lowly people who don't deserve it. And I think it would be more unfair for him to just leave it up to um, humans to try to fight for. Good point. I like that. Uh, you, you probably listen to our sister, <laughs> right? And going back to what Crystal is saying, just to add on it, right? What is fair? Fair is giving what we deserve. 
And what do we deserve? So if I'm going to throw a, a, a drawing here, <laughs> going to put some drawing here, what is fair, okay? We are all a bunch of sinful people, right? So let me put it here, okay? Sinful people. Go to the second covenant. Yep. The covenant of work. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we'll fit into that. But uh, before, see, uh, what is fair, right? Giving these sinful people, people what, what they deserve. And Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So what is fair? If God is going to give us death, and we also know that no one is righteous. No, not one. Nobody seeks God. We all deserve to go to hell. So if God is going to choose some people over here and elect some people, Is there unrighteous in this? If God, like the argument of Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9, I will have mercy to whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion to whom I have compassion. We all deserve to go to hell. So if God is going to elect sinners and put it here on the state of grace, is he committing sin? Of course not, right? And we need to remember that when we talk about justice, when we talk about justice, giving people what they deserve, and we need to remember that there's two kinds of Justice, right? The opposite is injustice, or we call it uh, non justice, right? So there's justice, giving God what we deserve, and we all deserve hell. And there's also non justice. But we know that there's two kinds of non justice, right? One is injustice. Right? Is there injustice in God? No, because He is holy and righteous. His ways are perfect. But there's another form of in, I mean, non justice. And what is that other one? Mercy. Or we call it grace. So going back again, if we have sinful humanity and God choose to extend mercy and grace, he's not committing injustice, but he's giving mercy. And that's what we are coming from. That God out of his mercy and grace we don't deserve it, and yet God gave it to us. And that's what covenant of redemption is all about. It's about grace and mercy. It's about grace and mercy. Does anybody here deserve grace and mercy? Oh, because I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Or because I do this, because I do that. And that's the reason why understanding this, you know, it, it should give us comfort. It should give us gratitude. Gratitude in a sense that, yes, we're all sinners, and yet, yet God put us here in his mercy before the foundation of this world. 
not only grace and mercy, God proclaims us righteous. God proclaims righteous. Whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. And that's where Eddie's coming from. We're going to talk about the next covenant. Why we need to understand the covenant of works. Covenant of works. And this is the passage. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, 17. God made a covenant with uh, Abraham. Uh, Abraham. Abraham. Keep thinking of Abraham. Adam. That the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but, the, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat, you shall surely die. So there's the stipulations or the law. You obey and you will have life, represented by the tree of life. If you disobey, represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Did Adam and Eve die right away? Mm -mm. No. Spiritually, right? But this promise is they will die physically and spiritually. But, of course, eventually they die. <laughs> but out of that curse, out of that curse, the promise of salvation came in. When God pronounces the curse, the first family, and when we look on Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his seal. That is the first promise of the gospel, that out of the seed of a woman there will come a savior who will strike Satan and death. The proto evangel the first good news of the Bible. Going back again to what Ed is saying, covenant of works. How does it fit in to the promise of salvation? And the, the other week we talked about the first Adam, right? Where can we find that? In Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 18. What did the first Adam did? He sinned. And he plunged humanity into sin. The transmission or the imputation of sin. And that's what the Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 18 is all about. The first Adam. Because... Adam was put in a probationary period, right? If you obey, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. The second Adam, who is that second Adam? Christ. Christ fulfilled the covenant of work that the first Adam was not able to do. Thomas? Uh, first Okay. So that third implies the difference in the first Adam and the second Adam. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Apostle Paul speaks about it. Right? In, in that passage. And same thing with Romans. The first Adam plants us into sin. That's why we all became a sinful being. The second Adam gives us righteousness. And that is the reason why Jesus Christ has to undergo all the fulfillments of the law. He fulfilled all the law. That's why he needs to be subjected into the laws of man and the laws of God in order to complete. See, that part is a part of the covenant of redemption that God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. That his son was going to come 
and fulfill, fulfill. what and Adam built. To what, jumping on what uh -huh. uh, Thomas said is that that's why he was deity. That's why he was born of a virgin. He's, he's God. Uh, that, that, that's right. See how it fits in, right? The harmony and unity of the Bible. And that's the better reason when, when, when Jesus Christ uh, came to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, you get me to get baptized? You should be the one baptizing me. What did Jesus say? He said, stop it. <laughs> Let's do this. So that the law must be fulfilled. Because he himself, Jesus Christ, needs to fulfill the requirements of the law. What Adam failed to do, Christ did it. The covenant of works. And that's the reason, you know, we are saved by work. Oops. <laughs> but not your work, the work of Christ. And the connection between the work of Christ is through Faith alone, in Christ alone, grace alone. Now, of course, there's so many sub-covenants that involve here. In, when we talk about the covenant of grace, there is the Wahi covenant, which is symbolized by the rainbow, Abrahamic covenant, and the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. And at the end, in the Old Testament, Prophet Jeremiah speaks about, I will make a new covenant. I will cut a new covenant. And when Jesus Christ on the night up before uh, getting crucified on the cross, Luke chapter 20, 22, verse 19 to 20, Jesus Christ took the bread, gave thanks and broke it. He said, Gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. This cup is the new cutting of blood. In my blood, which is shed for you. That is the fulfillment of all the covenants. Covenant of redemption, covenant of work. It's the grace of God. So it all fit in together and in harmony with one another. So, uh, well, we have, uh, we have uh, say, three minutes. Uh, any thoughts or any questions, uh, especially for the young people? Uh, is there something that, that is not clear or something, that, um, or something that you might have just learned or you want to share? Let's ask the young people. I know uh, Carl is uh, reading a book uh, about the covenant. And uh, he's been reading this for the past few weeks now. Uh, Carl, you want to share something? Um, no, I mean, I just, yeah, I'm also just learning about covenant theology now, but um, just knowing that it, it's, it's not up to us and that this whole covenant is unconditional and that it, Ultimately, up to Jesus to to save you, and it's not up to us, not anything that we do, and that just brings the greatest assurance to me, mm -hmm. and hopefully to everyone mm -hmm. here in this room. But um, I mean, one observation, uh, I guess, just to just to add to um, just to to show how much better Jesus is. Um, I, I read it somewhere, I forgot where, but um, 
he makes observation of how, how much better Jesus is because Adam had everything going for him in the garden. Yet, and, and Jesus, and, and he failed. And then Jesus had everything against him, stacked against him, he was tempted, and everything. Yet, he succeeded. And so, I think that, that was just a, a good observation. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. Thank you, Carl. That's a very good summary of uh, what we have discussed. And uh, to, to, uh, as we conclude this message, uh, let's go back again to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 3 to 6. Where every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not have be a priest, since there are priests who have gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed, when he's about, what, about to make the tabernacle, for he said that, so that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain, verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. It, it's not just a new covenant, it is the final covenant, the fulfillment of all the covenant in Christ alone. And that's why in the Gospel of John, we talk about the covenant, right? As the agreement plus the promise. When we're in the promise, is highlighted. It's basically a unilateral agreement. That is God who fulfilled his promise. It's not about you. It's about God. That no matter... Now, no matter how much you fail in this life, that it is God who is responsible for that promise of salvation. He is the high priest who is without sin. He is the perfect sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And he is also, remember, the word, the word of God, the very promise of God became flesh. And that's the reason why John put it this way. That in the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. The promise became flesh through Jesus Christ. And hallelujah for that. He is the final covenant and fulfillment of all the covenant. And we ought to worship him and give him the glory. Amen to that? Amen. Oh, Thomas, uh, can you close us in prayer? <coughs> Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just thankful, Lord, that you have brought all of us together today. Lord, we can't help but let our mind think back, Lord, that in eternity's past, what you must have been thinking. Lord, when you chose some of us out of a race of sinful people, Lord, we believe that within ourselves therein lies the miracle, Lord, because knowing in of ourselves that we're not righteous, it's only your righteousness through faith, in the faith our faith in your righteousness that makes us righteous. So, Lord, we're thankful for the message we've heard today. We're thankful that you provided yourself a man today as you spoke up uh, in, about David, young David. I, you, I'm, I'm just thankful that you provided us a teacher today, someone to lead us and guide us and show us the truths of Scripture. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, bless Arnold and his family uh, Lord, just bless them with all the heavenly blessings that you have in, in store for uh, your people, Lord. Uh, and uh, Lord, I just ask that everyone sitting under the sound of my voice, that they may uh, glean or, or take something away from this message today that would help them with their trials and tri tribulations, the things that they meet in this life, Lord, in this world, Lord. 
just go on to, uh, to, to continue to grow in their faith toward you, Lord. Uh, we just ask uh, uh, that you would bless Pastor Don today as he brings a message to us, Lord. We, we ask that you would open hearts and uh, even ears and eyes to see the thing that he's speaking of, Lord. And we'll be careful to thank you, Lord, for all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Thomas, for that uh, pastoral prayer. <laughs>